If you wanna hear about St. Louis, tune in to the Bucket List Show Weekly. Hear what Marissa and Luke say. It drops every Wednesday, got a dope new guest every single week. Buckle up for the ride, who's it gonna be? Who's on the show today? They rep St. Louis. What to do in the loo on a late night, or maybe what to do on a date night? Yeah. Bucket list has you covered, they know what's going on, what's going on, they'll give you, hey, 18 different things to do, or 19 if you need one more to choose, yeah, this city, city, city is a place we call home, a place we call home, yeah. What's up, St. Louis? Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of the STL Bucket List Show. I'm your host, Marissa Farrell. And I am your other host, Lucas Farrell. Um, and we couldn't do this show without our friends at the Regional Arts Commission of St. Louis. Um, Jay, Vanessa, the entire team over there, um, just always being a great partner and, uh, you know, not only you know, educating us on who to bring on the show, but also just helping us have the show. Um, and if you guys didn't know, St. Louis is an arts town. More people travel to St. Louis to visit art, the art scene, whether that's establishments or artists um, than sports. So St. Louis is an arts town. Fun fact. Um, and of course, Matt in the back on the ones and twos at Half Coast Studios, cutting up a perfect episode for Spotify, Apple, YouTube, Instagram, everything. So... Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Um, so today, speaking of art um, and productions, we are going to get into it. We've got a very special guest. Um, we've got Tom Ridgely. I said it right. Awesome. Producing uh, artistic director with the Shakespeare Festival. How are you today? I'm awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, thanks for, yeah, thanks for coming in. Um, so we always start off just getting to know our guests for listeners. So I know we were talking a little bit uh, before the show just about you know, you're not from St. Louis. So if you want to just dive in and give us that insight as to where you're from, where you grew up, all the things that we need to know. Well, I'm from Indianapolis originally. Um, uh, but I, a, a great aunt and uncle lived and still live in South County. So it was a place we visited a lot growing up. Um, but, you know, they lived out you know, in a neighborhood. And so I, that's mostly what I remember other than, you know, the arch and yeah. the stadium and some Maybe. of those things. Um, but no, I, I grew up in Indianapolis. I went to college in Indiana and then I went out to New York and started a theater company out there with a friend of mine that I'd gone to college with. And we just built that up over time, over about 15 years. And, and then I came here. So not a lot of stops on my yeah. journey, um, but that's sort of the uh, that's the Reader's Digest version. So when you went to school um, in Indiana, did you, were you, what were you studying? Well, I started out as, as a triple major oh. in theater and biology okay. and Spanish. Wow. And then like a lot of people, I hit organic chemistry and I said, no, thank you. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> No thanks. It was fun while it lasted. It was fun while it lasted. It sounded so. great. But it was sounded it? sounded great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I stuck with, with theater and Spanish. And then, but then a funny thing happened to me. Um, I, I, you know, I'd gotten into, you know, Indiana University was a, it wasn't a big theater program. I, and so, and I didn't know that that's what I wanted to go there for. So by the time I realized that's what I wanted to do, it was, it was where I was, um, and I was started looking around for like other things I could do to just, I don't know, uh, like supplement it, I guess. So I, a lot of, I took a lot of, you know, there's an amazing music school in, in Indiana. So you know, I took voice lessons and like lots of dance classes and things like that. And I got, and immediately if you're a boy or a man in a dance class, people just, you know, you're like this like, I, it's like there's this aura about yeah. you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you, you, I got quickly recruited um, into the ballet program at Indiana University, which actually was a, v a really strong program. Okay. So I stuck around. I graduated, um, but they sort of offered me a spot in their in their um, in their program, which was really rigorous. So I stuck around there and did that for a year uh, before I ended up moving to New York with that buddy of mine. So when you were at I'm going back now to high school. Did you, were you in plays and involved in theater? Is that what kind of led you to yeah. do that in college a little bit? Yeah, I'd gone to like a private school for mm -hmm. elementary, middle school. And then for high school, I went to a big public high school. And it, like freshman year, I was, I was just adrift. I, like I hadn't found my thing. I hadn't found my people. Um, like I was a little lost. And then the spring of that year, they, they did the spring musical. And for whatever reason, like the kind of like friends I had were going. And so I went 
and it was Guys and Dolls. Okay. And, you know, I'll never forget, you know, at the end of, like, Sit Down, You're Rocking the Boat, when like, Nicely Nicely Johnson, like, jumped up on the table, mm-hmm. started belting out Sit Down. I just, you know. I love this. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was, like, I was in heaven. And it reminded me that I had done a sh- couple shows in middle school and stuff like that. So I made my friends promise. I said, you know, next time this comes around, like, force me to go out for this. That's yeah, and I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of this. They're the best. I used to love watching the school plays. And yeah. just, like, I would... I wish I had the courage to like do it. Cause I'm like, it's so fun to watch. And I wish I was like that person. Yeah. Like and not you still shy. get to enjoy them too. Well, I still got like yeah. our school just did one last week yeah. and I'm like, I love, I love to see them. If There's I some of the best things you'll see. I mean, mm-hmm. honestly, some of my favorite nights, cause I've been involved in high school programs as an adult and yeah. as a professional, but there, there's something about the like purity of like the joy mm-hmm. that you know kid takes in those things. Definitely. Yeah. But the coolest thing about my school was they had this thing called junior spectacular, which was this, Kids would write their own shows, and it was this cu- competition. There were cuts. You know, everyone would write these acts, and you did a ten-minute excerpt, yep. mm-hmm. and you got judged, and then the final four went on mm-hmm. to like these full productions. Wow. So that was a huge deal that at the school. Um, so, That's but really but it cool. gave you a chance. It gave us a chance to write something, to you know, essentially to direct it, to produce it, to do all of it, mm-hmm. and that was even more than sort of the school plays and musicals. A thing that was. Yeah. Uh, sort of turn me on about sure. yeah. It's what, the creativity. That, it's the creativity that goes into it, and even with anything, you know. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about New York. So, you know, you're in New York for 15 years. What made you? What was like that moment where you took what you learned in New York and you moved to St. Louis? Like, was there an aha moment, or was there an opportunity that came up? Yeah, I mean, Waterwell, the company I started, was an ensemble company. So we created new things. That's basically what we did. Mm-hmm. Um, was we created and presented new work. It was a lot of times it was be adaptations of older things, classics, some of them, although we'd always sort of shied away from Shakespeare. Um, so, like, that was sort of what we were best at. Um, but then I got an opportunity after a while. Yeah, I sort of went down the directing path, and a lot of my friends, you know, were sort of on more of the acting route. But I got a chance to assist and direct a play, a Shakespeare play at the. New York Shakespeare Festival, the public theater. Mm -hmm. And like that was a big aha moment because like I said, I'd always sort of shied away from Shakespeare. I kind of felt about it the way a lot of people do, which is like, uh, you know, it's so old, it's so musty, it's so sort of hard to, you know, parse or understand. And it's so precious, you know, it feels so sacred. Yeah. Shakespeare. Don't touch it. Yeah, don't touch it. You don't want to put your own twist on it. Yeah, Which so many people do. And then it's like... Ripped to shreds and mm-hmm. so many criticisms. Mm-hmm. But I, but this was a great production. And more, most importantly, it was directed by this incredible guy named Barry Edelstein, who now runs the Old Globe out in San Diego. But he's just a master. And he brought it to life and just sort of like revealed it to me and to everyone who was there. But even for me, it was the first chance really getting to sort of see it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was an obscure Shakespeare play. And it was just so interesting um, and you know, relevant. It was right. It was time of Athens. It was all about like greed and ingratitude. It was right after the financial crash of t- 2009. Yeah. So, you know, I, I thought, I remember thinking if this is one of the like lesser Shakespeare plays, if it's one of the more sort of obscure ones that doesn't get done a lot. Mm-hmm. Just imagine, you know, how much else is out there in those ones that, that are the real, you know, sort of mm-hmm. top tens. Yeah. Name droppers. Yeah. Yeah. So I did. I had done. I done a lot of new work. I'd done a lot of Shakespeare. And after that, um, and as I said, I'd, I'd worked in a lot of education programs. Waterwell had a big partnership with the New York City Public School, okay. where we delivered their drama program. And it was a. It was like a serious conservatory style thing. Like it was a public school. It was free. Kids came from all five boroughs, but you know they had to audition to get in. Mm-hmm. So it was really rigorous. Um, and the Shakespeare Festival here just was. Focusing on all those things. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to say all the things you just mentioned. I'm like thinking of all the things that St. Louis touches on, like the writing. Well, you kind of talked about like your school um, mm-hmm. growing up, but like there's the writing program that you guys have and um, going out to other schools and getting people familiar with the language and all of that. So, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, it was it was it was a perfect fit. Um, and I, you know, I couldn't be happier. Yeah. So talk to us about how long you've been here in St. Louis um, and just your role with the St. Louis. It's St. Louis Shakespeare Festival. That's it is. The organization. Yeah. That is the okay. organization. So you tell got us it. about your role and, and what that involves. 
Well, I'm the artistic director, so, you know, that's sort of the, you know, CEO of the operation really is what it is, um, which is what's fun about it for me is that, you know, you're involved in all aspects. Um, you're both involved in sort of the creative aspects of putting on the show. You know, you get, you know, we work with directors and they're the real sort of visionaries for those things, but you're working very closely with them. You're trying to realize their vision. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you're even sort of in ways sort of shaping that. Mm -hmm. Um, but also you're sort of building this organization, um, you know, that's much bigger than any one show and, and trying to figure out how it can make a difference in St. Louis. And that to me is a really exciting project because that, that's just, that never ends, you know, shows close and they, and they end yeah. and that's, what's beautiful, but also sort of bittersweet about the theater, but an organization, you know, can, can, you know, the work continues. And so mm -hmm. those things that we're able to do over time are the things that, you know, mean the most to me. So it's the 23rd year this year. Yeah, yeah. 23rd season. 23rd season, yep. um, which is incredible. Um, you know, so I guess 2000 is yeah. when, when it kicked off. So what shows are we getting this year? I mean, people are excited. The drop, like literally as of this podcast recording, just came out like a couple days ago. Yeah, so. yeah. That's always an amazing moment. The drop I mean, went crazy. People were... Oh, it's yeah. so funny because I was looking for it too because I'm like, obviously, yeah. you know. And she's off social media now. She's, so, she gave up social media. But I, yeah, before I was like on the website and I'm like, oh, they haven't announced what the show is this season and now yeah. you guys just And I sent her a screenshot. She gave up social so media for it. Lent and I was like, I sent her a screenshot. I said, boom, right. there you go. Yep. Nice, <laughs> nice. She got you. It's a great, yeah. great choice. So tell us about our picks for the season. Well, the big park show is Twelfth Night mm -hmm. and that I think is the drop people are usually really most waiting for, um, which is great. I mean, that's definitely in the, the you know, sort of that greatest hits mm -hmm. list of Shakespeare plays, um, especially for the comedies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's exciting about this one is it's directed by this woman named Lisa Portes. She runs the directing program at DePaul in Chicago, which is one of the very best programs in the country. And she's also a really active director herself, working at a lot of the most important theaters Um in America. So uh, she's really exciting as an artist and she's got this really exciting vision for the play. And, you know, Twelfth Night starts with, you know, Sebastian and Viola, they're the, you know, these twins and they, they're shipwrecked and they wash up on the shore of Illyria, which is this place they've never been. And they have to find their way. And Lisa's from Cuba or her family's Cuban. And so it's for her that that experience just sort of resonated on a personal level. And she's decided to set it in Miami today, um, which is obviously this beautiful uh, sort of, you know, uh, colorful, like celebrity-esque, like. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I mean, you know, the sort of the, the, the energy, the music, the, you know, the, the culture, all of it is, right. is, I mean, you can see it in the designs, yeah. mm -hmm. um, that Carlos and Cartel did. It's just so vibrant. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and perfect also because Twelfth Night is, has more songs than any other sh play that Shakespeare wrote. Mm -hmm. um, there's this character Festy who just sings constantly. He's a singing sort of entertainer. And so the being able to pull in all of that Latin music into the world of the Twelfth Night yeah. uh, is going to be really exciting. That is so cool. So, um, and I didn't even realize that um, when it comes to production and you guys choosing like what play you're going to do, it's, like, so you're outsourcing the director. Like, she's mm -hmm. from Chicago. So is mm -hmm. that you, that's what you guys do every year? It's Well, we always hire a director. I mean, sometimes they're out of town. Sometimes they're local. Okay. You know, last year was this guy, Bruce Longworth. And he's actually directed more shows than anybody. Okay. Um, five or six for us, at least, I'd want to say. Um, and, you know, he's a professor at Webster. Mm -hmm. And he just happens to also be one of, like, the greatest Shakespearean directors Amazing. In the country. What yeah. you do is good. And he's right here in our backyard. He's right here in our backyard. Yeah. So um, we're lucky to have that. Um, and, you know, I've directed them. You know, Rick, my predecessor, directed them. So it's a, it's always a balance of, and we try to do that really with everything, especially with the park, that it's a balance of local and out of town. Yeah. I mean, we want to lift up what's here. And we also sort of want to bring the best that we can to St. Louis. So is it, um, because we've only been going, I mean... We've a few been years, for obviously, years since I've been studying, right, mm -hmm. English. But is that normal to kind of create like a new adaptation of the play? Like since we're setting it in Miami for this one, does that happen often? I'm just curious. Yeah. I mean, I mean, first of all, you know, 
all of that, all, all of what I just described about the production is really just the design. Mm -hmm. It's the scenery, it's the costumes, mm -hmm. it's the music, it's the casting. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the play is the play. Um, you know, there may be a few little things that we get into. We may change things. Sure. And that happens all the time. You might swap out the town of a name, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the name of a town in England for the name of a town. Right. Wherever you were happening to set it. The little references like that. But the plot's um, there. But the plot's there, the language is there. Mm -hmm. So it isn't really like a, a, an adaptation of the script. Got it. As much as it is a sort of concept for the production. Okay. Um, but even that, you know, every, almost any time you go and see a Shakespeare play, it has been, if nothing else, like heavily abridged, you know, just a lot gets cut. Mm -hmm. Very rarely are, are you seeing every single word yeah. that, you know, is in the script. And often there's like multiple versions of the script, like you don't know what's what. So there are like a million decisions mm -hmm. that a director or producer has to make to, before what ends up on stage ends up on stage. Right. So coming from somebody on the outside, like not being involved in theater, but I want to like kind of see what the misconceptions that you might hear about somebody in your position that's been doing it. Like, are there like certain things that people think like, I guess like, like goes into production maybe or just bring awareness, I guess, of like <laughs> how long, like, yeah. what, like what's the timeline? Like what goes into the production, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is, I think, a surprisingly long period of planning and preparation. You know, it's it's more than a year from, yeah. you know, sort of like, oh, what you know, what's next year going to be? It's, a, it's happening. Yeah. Um, so you guys already know. Like, how early on in the year are you aware? We don't know what next summer is going to be. Okay. But we knew that we were going to be doing Twelfth Night before, I think, or, you know, at least that we were going to be working with Lisa yeah. and, mm -hmm. and before Much Ado was over last year. Okay. Um. So it's a, you know, it's basically a year long process and it's just, I think the amount of collaboration that goes into it, the sheer number of people mm -hmm. involved that it takes to put up a play. I mean, you see the actors and the cast is big maybe, or it's, or it's smaller, but you know, th that's very visible. And you think, oh, obviously there's a director and obviously there's designers, but you know, if you open up our playbill and read all the names, there's, you know, mm -hmm. dozens, if not hundreds, um, and it really is just a massive, massive operation. So I think the biggest misconception is that it's hard to memorize the lines. It's not hard to memorize the lines. It's pretty easy. Anyone could do it. You could yeah. do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it's it's not that hard. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's the biggest thing. It's like, oh, I would just freeze up there. It's like, no. like no, no, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Because you, yeah. you're saying these over and over again for like a month. You know, the yeah. rehearsal is for a month. And every day you're doing it. So you've just done it a hundred times. And you're going home and looking at So you at cast, it. like, tell us about the rehearsal. Like, you, so you guys train for, you know, like full on. And then it gets probably more rigorous as the as it gets closer. But like yeah. a lot of these people have other jobs, other things that they got going. Or yeah. it, like, tell us about that. Like how the cast, like how many hours do they have in that? I mean, it's just, it has to be insane because they just go through it so smoothly. Yeah. They come in about a month before opening. So they have four weeks, maybe four and a half of, mm -hmm. of rehearsal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's six days a week, eight hours a day. You know, everyone's there that whole time, but the director and the stage manager and those people wow. are. Um, the hour weeks then. So it's pretty fast. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also crazy. I was reading this book about Tennessee Williams and like the, the world premiere of Glass Menagerie, they had like two weeks of rehearsal. Wow. It was just like, so it, it's yep. kind of evolved. Sure. Um, but to do a big Shakespeare play, it, it really is helpful to have the time. Yeah. So when can people come see it? Um, well, it's always the Wednesday after Memorial Day, which is the 30th, 31st. There we go. Um, <laughs> yeah. Through June 25th, 26th, whatever that last Sunday so the is. The whole month of June. Basically, yeah. yep. Monday to Sunday, like what? Tuesday to Sunday, every night at 8 o'clock in okay. the Glen. It's completely free. Um, you know, things kind of get rolling around 6.30. People start showing up, picking out a spot, you know, bringing their blankets, their picnics. Yeah. Um, or hitting you know. up alley to get some blankets in the front. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be yep. there. We'll be there on the 31st. I want to go ahead and reserve one. Yep. Or maybe the next day, because that'll be the busy day. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. bring, bring your snacks. <laughs> Get your cozies and get ready. So yeah. I love that it's free. I, I just want to learn a little bit more about why it's free. Is that an, to make it accessible for everyone? You yeah. know, because obviously you guys could monetize this and make this. Yeah. You could make, you know, it, well, you could charge. It's a nonprofit. Yeah. So yeah. that's part of it. But yeah, but you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you know. It's, Most of the other nonprofits, no, I mean, you know, it, it's, I mean, free Shakespeare is sort of a thing. You know, we didn't make that up. That's, yeah, that's been around. Yeah. Um, but you know the 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 idea behind it is just that 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 these you know that this 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 body of work is 
so extraordinary um, and has so much to offer mm -hmm. um, in terms of wisdom and insight and truth and compassion uh, that it is, you know, that it really ought to be available to everyone. Yeah. Regardless, um, and so everything everything we're trying to do is how to make this easier, how to just like lower the bar of entry for anyone. So the easiest one, one easy thing to do is just to remove the cost of admission. Because let's face it, tickets can be expensive. You know, experiences right. are expensive. Like going out costs money. Um, and people are factoring that. Like, can I do it tonight? Can I do it again? You know, am I going to do it this or am I going to do this other thing? Mm -hmm. So we like to sort of wipe that out. Um, but also, you know, in in in, in the way we pick the plays and the way we, you know, sort of build the companies, you know, we're trying to sort of make it possible so that it, not only anyone can come, but that, but that a lot of people want to come because a lot of people see their lives or their experiences or their worlds sort of reflected back to them in some way. Which is the whole point of Shakespeare is just retelling human stories. Mm -hmm. I'm geeking out English. Nice. Nice. Stuff, we knew but, this was going to happen. Uh, we did. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about obviously the language. And mm -hmm. so, I, you know, I don't think, I mean, I teach my kids, it's not meant to be read. Like, yeah. sh like Shakespeare was meant to be seen. It mm -hmm. was meant to be performed. So mm -hmm. when people come and they're like, I'm sure there's that, I don't know what they're saying. And so there might be that like mm -hmm. block of mm -hmm. maybe not wanting to go. So how can people how do we encourage people to come who have a fear of not understanding what's happening? Yeah. It's such a hard uh, misconception. You talked yeah. about misconceptions yeah. earlier. I think that, that I think is the biggest misconception because a lot of people encounter it like we all did mm -hmm. in reading it in high school. Yeah. And to read it in high school is almost impossible. I mean, yeah. it's so hard. I mean, it, it's, it's good to do because it's a stretch and it's a grow and it's an exposure, but to really experience it, um, it's very hard to do because the language is very old. And like you said, it wasn't meant to be read, but to hear it, to hear it spoken, to hear it acted well, it's actually not hard at all to understand. Mm -hmm. Now, what most people will experience is, I don't know, it might be something like if you're going to listen to jazz or classical or something, um, or if you're watching a foreign movie, there may be a sort of a minute where it like, there may be 10 minutes at the top where your ears are sort of adjusting. Mm -hmm. um, but pretty soon what happens is you forget that it's anything other than normal conversation right. mm -hmm. um, and, and and it's just as easy to follow and enjoy and experience it. You know, the comment that we get over and over again is like, you know, how did you change it? What did you do to make it so easy? Did you update mm -hmm. the language? And we didn't because it's English and there's some funny old words, but yeah. um, you know, but again, actors know how, you know, good actors know how to, how to, how to make it very easy to understand. If you watch what's happening in the body language, like that's a big mm -hmm. part of like when we're teaching, it's like, Okay, we're going to watch this. And I'm mm -hmm. like, look at the facial expressions. Look at the body language. That is so telling in itself. So yeah. if you, you know, can observe that and then you're really just listening, you can, mm -hmm. you can kind of pick it up. So mm -hmm. as, your, as your organization grows, I've noticed that you guys have done more activations. So like I'm, yeah. I'm looking at your set list now. You have Shakespeare in the streets with the soccer ball. So you're going to be doing something mm -hmm. down at the soccer mm -hmm. stadium, which yep. is super cool. I think last year you guys did Bebo Mill. Yeah. Is that, where's that? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So was that something that, you know, kind of evolved? Like, hey, we can't just do this in June, like, or in May and June. We have to like do things throughout the year to keep that, you know, to keep the, yep. the energy, you know? Definitely keep the energy for the organization. Like that's super helpful. But also, it's it's again, how do you make this this the, these treasures? You know, what is in these plays that is that has something to offer? And how do you how do you how do you offer? How do you make that offer? You know, more um, appealing or more you know easy to accept? And you know, one one amazing thing that a Shakespeare play can do is it can sort of resonate with something else, right? And what Shakespeare in the Streets does is it, it sort of asks the Shakespeare play to kind of resonate with the story of a community. Um, and, you know, so that really is about, th that program, Shakespeare in the Streets, is about the community. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and the play is just trying to sort of help reveal that story um, or to lift it up um, and to, you know, sort of to magnify it mm -hmm. um, and to help people understand why it matters. Uh, but it's really about us sort of saying like, you know, in St. Louis, 
in particular, but, you know, anywhere where there's, you know, communities that are sort of on the margins or sort of, you know, under the radar, um, but that are vibrant, that are important um, and that need to be lifted up and celebrated. You know, how can an organization like a festival find a way to do that? So the thing we do is we leave Forest Park and we go to these places yeah. and we ask our audience to come there, too. So that's what's great about going to Bevo Mill or the Ville or Old North or Maplewood or whatever it is. Um, it's it's people coming there to a place they might not ever go right. um, or often go, mm -hmm. and to really sit in that space and to hear the story and to, and to watch it, li you know, told by the people who live it because it's actors, it's professional actors, mm -hmm. and it's it's just regular folks. Yeah, and interacting with the there. community and then having those neighbors that maybe don't go to Forest Park, they just go outside and they yep. walk up there and, you know. Mm -hmm. So this year's cool. focus is soccer. Yep. Great timing. Yes. Right? <laughs> nice, nice. And that's done. on, yep, Olive and 22nd. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's going to be special. Yeah. Definitely going to wow. go to that one too. So how, like, what's the, how is the soccer, like, built in? Like, what what's that production kind of? Well, it always like? starts with conversation. So first it's us, it's trying to, just talk to people yeah. and trying to learn from them, you know, from that community. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the soccer community, okay. which is really like the soccer, which is multifaceted, right? And, you know, there's soccer communities. Mm -hmm. um, so trying to just understand what that, what that story is, you know, what their experience has been, you know, what their past has been, what they hope the future will be like. And then we sort of try to think, oh, well, which Shakespeare play feels like it sort of fits that like a puzzle. Okay. Um, and so for this year, the one that made the most sense is Henry V because Henry V is a history play and it's about this, you know, these this series of battles or this war between England and France. So it's got this sort of, this element of competition and winners and losers. Um, it's also got this very famous speech called the St. Crispin's Day speech, which is Henry V, you know, exhorting his soldiers to, you know, to to fight on, to fight harder, to carry the day. I mean, it's sort of like the original yeah. like halftime locker room yeah. speech pep talk. Yeah, cool. um, I like that tie in. Yeah. yeah. So there's that. And it's and it's one of the few Shakespeare plays that's got a really like obvious uh, sports element. Um, it's it's a tennis element because okay. this is 14th century or, you know, mm -hmm. England. Um, but uh, it's a taunt that the Prince of France uses to to the King of France, to Henry V, to say like, you, you're too busy playing tennis mm -hmm. to be minding the shop you know your kingdom mm -hmm. so uh you're going down nice mm -hmm. that's exciting yeah another good one to see we haven't done um gone to any of the traveling uh, i remember shows. the bevo one and i i just love that and i like yeah I, I like that you guys are going outside like you're taking the show on the road if you, like in, for better for lack of a better word you guys are like you know going to these neighborhoods and yeah. these communities and and really putting in the work so, so. talking about going into the community communities do you want to shed a little light on torco because mm -hmm. that's what is it six actors yep. traveling and, yeah. and so how is that like is that um like actors who are going into schools or like what does that program look like that's 24 smaller parks okay all over the region so Got it's it. it's it's basically i mean you know it's 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 a scaled down version mm -hmm. of what we do in Forest Park, um, and with the same idea behind it again. Is sort of you know, how do we make this as easy as possible for people to experience and to get the most out of? And not everybody comes to Forest Park. Not everybody is, can easily get to Forest Park, um, or not everybody feels like going to that much trouble <laughs> to see a Shakespeare play. But the beautiful thing about Turco is it happens in neighborhoods, um, and it's also free. But it, it takes out that transportation element. It takes out that logistical element. It starts early. It's at 630. It's 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're, you're, it's, it happens all under daylight. You know, you're walking home before it's dark. We, we started off with this thing called a living study guide, which gets to that language thing, mm -hmm. where the actors, like you said, six actors, they come out and they introduce themselves. They say, hey, I'm playing this character. I'm playing that character. Here's the play we're doing. You know, like watch out for this because this is a big deal in this play. Um, and you know, and she's going to do a little moment for you right now to show you what that to be ready for. Yeah, it. to be ready oh for it. Awesome. Is. That's, that's and so helpful. and so you get really familiar. You get a little refresher of the plot. You get to know the actors, so that feels like oh, okay, cool. Um, you know, you're already kind of connecting a little bit. And then and then when that happens. You remember, because uh, you've just heard it, you know, half an hour ago or whatever it is. Um, so that is, 
the one COVID pivot for us that stuck. Yeah. And I was going to ask because you guys, um, what was that? Was that a COVID thing? The arches? The painted. Yeah. The paint, Is that what yeah. that was? Mm. It was like art Because it was like you moved sh- around and there was different things happen mm-hmm. like it was like what yeah. like two or three people it was COVID because everybody was walking we were so spread out and it was such a nice walk and our friend brock did like this really nice arch yeah um, right there on the bridge mm-hmm. amazing yep by the basin yep yeah that was the stroll so that was almost that was like 15 16 stops spread out around forest park mm-hmm. um that was the first real kind of live covid thing okay. that you're like let's did. do something you're yeah like, let's... we couldn't do our park show that summer and then we thought oh well we actually that we can was really cool we just have to do it differently mm-hmm. um but you know that we haven't done one since really I and mean, we did a version we did a, different, a similar thing in the central west end that winter but uh-huh. we haven't done anything like that in forest park but there's so many amazing parks in st louis and again you know there's 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 not a lot of really of a what you might call culture happening, you know, things being put on by cultural organizations outside of a few limited pockets in Grand Center and Webster and downtown a little bit, Tower Tower Grove Grove a little bit. But none of what you would think of as the arts institutions are are, are putting on, you know, Mm -hmm. work in Tower Grove. I mean, there's tons of like arts and culture with the festivals and things like that um, and music and- But it might be just a weekend or a day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And it tends to be a little more, yeah, like less, um, it's less institutional, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, So as an arts institution, we're trying to, we're trying to get ourselves out to as many corners of the region as possible. So that's North City, South City, it's the county, it's Illinois. Mm -hmm. We got to Herman. Oh, wow. um, so it's tr- it's this urban rural like sort of metro wrap in that we're trying to that's do. That's incredible. With that's yeah. awesome. You're covering Herman a lot of bases. Nice. Get the winery and <laughs> go hang out. It's amazing. But the coolest thing about Herman is Herman's <laughs> a beautiful town. Yeah. You know, like great place to go. Nice yeah. weekend getaway. Tight knit community too. Tight knit community. And but there's like lots of places. You know, when we go out there, we get people from Jeff City. Yeah. We get people from Wentzville because yeah, that's right. you know it's it's half an hour, it's 45 minutes for them. As opposed to getting into, you know, Forest Park, you know, it could be whatever, an hour and a half. An hour, yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. And then leaving Forest Park when everybody leaves at the same time, then you're just like, shoo, shoo. Yep, yep, we'll get home <laughs> eventually. So I'm going to touch on, I guess, one more part of um, the program and the Confluence Fighters. Mm-hmm, I'm going to mm-hmm. touch on that. And just, just because we like to... Um, just let people know, like, if they have a hidden talent, like, yeah. where maybe you can get yep. involved and expand on that. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's a program for regional writers. Okay. Um, and for us, regional is Missouri and Illinois. Mm-hmm. Um, so the idea behind it is we're, we're, you know, there's, when you look at the work that's produced in the, you know, the professional theater in America, you know, it tends to originate in a couple of coastal centers. Um, and so it tends to bring with it those sort of perspectives, um, you know, those values. Uh, so, but that also like leaves out a lot of the country. And so, you know, we believe that people in St. Louis, people in Missouri, people in Illinois have, uh, not only, you know, are just as worthy of, of sort of, of, of being a part of the national conversation in that way, but they actually have something unique and important and distinctive and special to bring to that. Mm-hmm. You can't get any other way than by hearing or, you know, seeing one of their plays. Um, but they might not have the same opportunities to, to grow and to develop and to, you know, work on their crafts, um, to, to, um, you know, to build their network. So it's it's a one-year playwriting workshop where we, the festival, commissions essentially a new play from from three writers a year. Um, they go through this, you know, a, a very long development process okay. that culminates in a weekend of three staged readings. Mm-hmm. So sort of first looks at these new plays. Um, and people come from all over and they see them and people respond. And so the writers learn about how people are receiving their play. Um, And then, you know, the idea is that hopefully these plays will then go on to future productions. And I think this is our fourth year. We've had maybe 12 or 13 plays commissioned. Yeah. And of them, you know, I think five, almost half have gone on to productions other places. So that's the idea that these plays start to then become a part of the repertoire Mm -hmm. um, in America. And to be coming out of St. Louis, like, you know, what was it that was just here that went to Broadway? Was it Lion King? 
Uh, they, were, they were working. Karate Kid is karate the one kid, that was. Kid. Yeah, I was. Mm-hmm. I was thinking. Yeah, Karate Kid yep. was here for like a month, and then yep. now they're off on Broadway. But like to have that happen in St. Louis, and you're right about the resources. And we've talked talked to Regional Arts Commission about that. Is like why like musicians and all these people they don't have to leave. You know how can we help people here get the right resources? And then they got to be able to make money. Yeah, they got to get paid to do their thing. So that's really what it's about. It's yeah. like we want to pay you to do your thing. Yeah. So people, if you've written a play <laughs> and you want to get paid to write another play, apply uh, for Confluence. Uh, you know, it's all, it's up on our website. Uh, applications are open, and uh, it's awesome. People love it. I think the coolest thing about it is that there's there's like this audience for it. Like there's people that come like every night to these readings, like they just love sort of being a part of it. And that's really what it's trying to be. Is like, oh, there's this culture of new play development here. Yeah, and it's not just three writers a year. It's sort of where actors are learning how to work on new plays. Writers are getting better at writing plays. Audiences are learning how to like, you know, sort of receive a new play, which is very different yeah. than receiving a sort of Shakespeare play. That's so cool. I love that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely apply if that's, if that's your talent for <laughs> sure. Um, all right. I'm going to ask you something goofy mm. just to share. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Give three interesting facts about the bard. About the bard. <laughs> Um, you know the the big knock against him is that in his wa- his will he left his wife the second best bed. That's right, and the first best bed went to. I don't know. Actually, do you know this? Their guest. Their guest. guest. Yes. Yeah. Well. Yes. That is sort of. Yeah. The, it, the, it seems like this viciously heartless thing to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. But the the sort of. The convention of hospitality then yeah. was that, yes, your best bed was yeah. sort of reserved for the guests. So <laughs> the, their second best bed was their bed, yeah. you know, the bed that they, you know, would have shared. Exactly. So, um, <laughs> uh, but that's a fun little tidbit. Um, you know, I think it's hard to understand, you know, th- he, he wrote, how are you count, like 36, 38 plays. Yeah. Um, that is mind bogglingly prolific. Like if you pick any other playwright that's working today mm-hmm. or even in the last 50 years, who's written a lot of plays, who produced a lot of plays, 10, 12 would be a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it, uh, you think of a guy like Neil Simon, who's like kind of you write off as a little bit of a hack because he was just sort of, I mean, I, he's brilliant, but he was, you know, the, you could kind of churn him out. Mm-hmm. Um, like another, here comes another Neil Simon play. And I think he, it was like 24 plays that he yeah. actually had written and produced. And that's like, he's at the, he's the, the far end of yeah. the spectrum. So for somebody to write that many plays and, you know, and there's masterpieces in history and comedy and tragedy and sort of romance and fantasy, to be able to do that much and that broadly and that well, um, I think it's just, it's important to remember that it's not just this guy that, you know, has sort of been canonized. Like he was a real just freak of nature, you yeah. know, like a Michael Jordan or somebody that yeah. was just like, had a combination of like natural gifts and like the drive mm-hmm. to like push himself yeah. to be the best, the best that he could possibly be. And to keep putting it out over and over and over and again. To keep putting it out Instead over Instead of just over stopping again. at like, oh, I have a hit. You mm-hmm. know, it's done. Yeah, he yeah. didn't need the money, you yeah. know. I mean, he didn't, I mean, he didn't need the status. It's not like after, you know, after three championships, do you know what I mean? Or after you like, you know, more? Like yeah. a lot of hits. Um, mm-hmm. But how lucky we are when those people like, live and die on this earth, you know what I mean? And, and, and that we get Leave to experience behind. of it in some way. Definitely. Forever. Like, that's real impact. That's, yeah, that's that's interesting. Like to make it a soccer event, it's like messy. Like, to be able to watch this guy play, to be alive while it's happening, you know, mm-hmm. it's going to be legendary, yeah. right. you know, Absolutely. for too long. Absolutely. Yeah. Old bard. So. <laughs> that was only two, but I'll think of a third. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll give you guys one. His, <laughs> Thank you. His birth date and death date, they think, is the same day, mm-hmm. which is April. 23rd mm-hmm. Oh. Mm-hmm. definitely death date is the 23rd yeah. they don't necessarily have a birthday but they assume oh interesting the, yeah i think he was baptized on the 26th, 26th. and yeah. typically they would you do it on the third day so mm-hmm. yeah um yeah death, yep. Yep. i'm gonna bring cupcakes to my kids to celebrate yeah. and mourn at all the same time day. yeah yes. right. <laughs> so they'll get two cupcakes With like little pictures they'll of get two food. cupcakes mm-hmm. No, just one. Oh, just one. I'm not just that one. cool. I'm not that cool. <laughs> it's too much sugar. It's a lot of, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of money to spend, that. too. No. <laughs> um, so I have the bucket list question while you're thinking of that other fact. So oh, yeah. as the STL Bucket List Show, our mission always has been to support people, places, and events that make St. Louis special and unique. In doing that, we've been able to build this community of 115,000 people that love to find events 
with people and places just like what you all do Mm -hmm. um which when we post this podcast it's going to go absolutely bonkers people are going to be so excited (laughs) um that's why i've been waiting to share it because i'm like i want to share it with the podcast (laughs) um but you know stl bucket list you as somebody that's from indiana um you know that did come here but let's say your family comes in town or friends or friends from new york like where are a few bucket list spots that you're taking them where are your favorite places to eat uh, where are your favorite parks, places to visit? Like it could even be events like sure. Shakespeare in the fest in, you know, it could be yep. a, a bucket list item, which it is, but yeah, yeah, of course they have Take all the Shakespeare <laughs> in the park. Um, I mean, you know, most, the, most of the people coming into town these days are, are, our parents, um, mm-hmm. which are like our daughter's grandparents. So with them, I'm going to give you a lot. You can edit yeah, this down. Yeah, go for it. With them, to. we're going to Joya's, we're going to Crown Candy. Yeah. Um, you know, we're hitting up the playground in the hill and like walking over to Volpe and getting, you know, some whatever. Yeah. Cured meats. Oh, right. Jesus. That's yeah. an amazing day. Um, you know, I, I've got to shout out Havana's, which is this restaurant down on Wash Ave, this Cuban restaurant that we just sort of found out about. Okay. Um, that's the food is unbelievable. Like the Cuban sandwiches, these croquettes, the, you know, the plantains, the empanadas, it's all just like amazingly yeah. delicious food sounds great um and uh it was new to us amazing the blues museum is is like a is an awesome spot mm-hmm. um and it's great because it's so well done um and also you can like do it all in like under an hour mm-hmm. um but just the the history of that music and how much of it's connected to the local sort of Culture, yeah, um, is super super powerful. And you guys will be there, right? You'll be at, is that the Blues Museum? Yeah, so yeah, yeah we'll we'll be there in November, December for mm-hmm. the Q Brothers Christmas Carol. And they've got an awesome venue, like listening room down there. Yeah, um, no, an amazing museum. Yeah, but the the exhibition, you know, the sort of like the standing exhibition there is mm-hmm. is super super well done. Um, and it's everything. It's you know, it's pictures. It's sort of it's installations. It's sound. Mm-hmm. Um, I, it really makes it come alive and like hits all the the, the high points. Which, speaking of, I mean, the other thing, you know, you guys, does everybody know this? There is, you can, today, it's in, you know, North St. Louis in the Greater Ville on Whittier Street. You can drive by Chuck Berry's house. It's still there. Mm -hmm. And it's the house that he lived in from like 1957 to like, I don't know what, like 1970, Mm -hmm. whatever. It's, and it's, could not be more modest. And it's where he wrote all those songs that you know mm-hmm. Chuck yeah. Berry for. Yeah. That's amazing. So that. fun fact, Chuck Berry lived Let's take a drive. And his final house was out where we grew up in Winsville. He yeah. had a big old house out yeah. in Forest Elb. That's like I think where he passed away at. Mm-hmm. Um, but we had Joe Edwards on way at the beginning of our podcast. Joe Edwards owns um the blue uh, Blueberry Hill and yep. and uh, the Duck Room and, and that's where Chuck played a show every single yeah. month for like two hundred and twenty months straight. Yeah. Every single month for like, like twenty mini, years. Mini residency. He played a yeah. he had a residency that's there. That's amazing. And people like you know, like two hundred and twenty shows at one spot in St. Louis that Just, he was and it was still the same price. He was like it was a cash handshake. Same price every week, you know. Um, So that was really the stories that Joe told us about Chuck were crazy, and all the other like Ed Sheeran played in that basement there back in the day. Really? Yeah, with two hundred and fifty people in there. We did this thing for uh, we did like this artist relief benefit Mm -hmm. during like the beginning of COVID, Mm -hmm. and for like the opening of it, we wanted to have Chuck Berry's version of St. Louis Blues because it was about St. Louis artists, and so uh, uh, we this local band was we that we knew was going to record a version of it because we couldn't use Chuck Berry's recording. <laughs> right. And they, you know, this is right during, this is like the beginning of COVID. And we, we did it in the basement of like some dude's house mm-hmm. where Chuck like recorded mm-hmm. the last album oh, that he ever wow. put out. But it was around that same time when he yeah. was doing all those like Blueberry Hill yeah. residencies. A, yeah. So, we, I mean, just sitting in that space. Yeah. Um, and the guy who was there like recorded it. So yeah. he had his like Chuck stories too about like what so a perfectionist much. he was. Like yeah. like yeah. single words he was like agonizing over, like trying to get the right one. He had so much swag too. Like what was that movie that somebody played him in? It was like one of the Motown, or I don't know it if it was um... the... Cadillac record. Yeah, he was like in that movie for a little bit. But yeah, he just had so much sauce. And like he would like always like he just was so defiant on what he thought was the yeah. way that it should be. Um so You know his yeah, song so Memphis, Tennessee? That yeah. very sweet Memphis, little Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I so that we're in Memphis because yeah. I was feeling that. Yeah. That record is like it's not even a recording, it's like a demo. He like didn't go to a studio to did it. He yeah. like did it 
in the back room of that house. Yeah. Like what you hear, if you like go to Spotify and put yeah. in Chuck Berry Memphis, like yeah. that, what comes in your earbuds, yeah. he put onto tape yeah. in the back we'll of play this. play it in right here. <laughs> <laughs> of this house that you can drive by right there. I mean, this should be like Graceland, you know? I mean, so th there's yeah. that like sort of history still here. Yeah, um, I'm going to so, go by there. We need to do a feature So someone, that. like just someone is living in that house? It's I not... don't think anyone's living there. No, I think his family owns it. Oh, you know, okay, I think okay. there's probably plans to do something with it. Yeah, um, they should. But yeah. the point being is that you can get that close to something that, that like Legendary. consequential, right? You know, like. Yeah. So that's cool. That is cool. Um, that's a good bucket list spot. That's that's an underrated spot that I've never heard of that I didn't know. I right? know. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, you know, his statues in the loop, but it's like that's just a his statue. statue in the loop. Yeah. Sumner High School. We went to high school, which is also in the Ville. Yeah. It's now the library, but it, at the time was the auditorium, and that's where he gave his first public performance. That's when and people went crazy, and he thought, oh. This is now the Chuck Berry here. show. Like we're just gonna do two episodes right. and make it all about Chuck Berry. But uh, you know, that's no, so that's cool. Yeah. But no, that that's awesome. That and there's some bands in the blues culture here, and that's what I talked about. Somebody just today, where like St. Louis doesn't have that niche that we hold on to. Like New Orleans and Memphis all have these niches that they stick to. Where St. Louis, we never like owned that culture and like blew it up to where like you go to Memphis yep. and it's just blues all down the yep. street. Yeah. You go to Beale Street yep. and like we have our spots yep. here that still do it. Um, but it's not too late. Like that's yeah. what I say. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like let's right. do that. St. Louis. Yeah. Can we? Have like, like shouldn't we? Um, shouldn't yeah. we own that more? Um, we should make that more it. of a thing. They talked about in Midtown like creating like a music district of live music because like yeah. there's no place that you can get an Uber, get dropped off and just walk. Yeah, Wouldn't yeah. Nice? Every other city yeah. kind of has that street. Yeah, even Kansas go City's walk. got that like yeah. kind of like 18th and Vine thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like kind of creating that, and that's what Midtown and the Cransburgs and a lot of those people are trying to create it. over they're there. They're doing it. They're it's doing a lot it. of work though, for sure. But yeah, um, making it more walkable because like there's like you go to um, Oyster Bar, they play music every single night. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of places that do, but it's like it's a drive city, it's a car city. You we know? need that commercial thing though, like more than just like oh I'm going to to see a show for entertainment. Yeah. Um, you know that, uh, you know. That, oh, this is where people make records. This is where people, you know, make commercials. You know, yeah. this is where people hire musicians yeah. because there's like creative industry around it. Yeah. Like, that's the thing I'd love to see mm -hmm. us Definitely. do. Definitely. Right? I think everyone's sort of fretting, like, how do we get another big corporate headquarters or how do we bring some, mm -hmm. you know, the geospatial thing, you know, these sort of big government corporate things. Yeah. Um, but there's that whole creative economy like you guys were saying at the top mm -hmm. um that's a huge driver and and is huge for artists because that's how they keep the pancakes on the table yeah right. i agree with that like commercials and we were talking about that downtown because like our office is down in ballpark village and i'm like oh we could film a commercial here there's nobody out right now it's like just completely open like that getting energy downtown would be a start yeah know? i mean if you think about movies like that you could there's nothing you couldn't film here yeah. you know yeah. or within like 30 miles of mm -hmm. here right. um so yeah like, it just feels so ripe for that so that's my like wish that's mm -hmm. my bucket list yeah, hope that's for it. our Found lifetime out. yeah 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 no that's amazing so yeah with that um thank you for coming on obviously we're super stoked um and we'll be sharing along as as the programs come out and we'll be there um, with you guys also being nonprofit, let's just throw out there like how people can support the organization yeah please support it's www.stlshakes.org um you can go to our donate page uh you know every, all these programs are completely free mm -hmm. And 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 I well, I just can't emphasize that enough. You yeah. know, we're not charging for these. Everything we do, we're is being supported by the community. Um, and every little bit counts. You can sign. You can do a five dollar monthly subscription. You know, like to the Shakespeare Festival is awesome. Huge goes a long way. So mm -hmm. yeah, and show up. Come to the park. Come to these events. You know, put a drop in the bucket. I mean, it's really people's presence that we want more than anything. It's yeah. gonna be a great season, and we're so excited to see it. And everyone, come out. So, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Thank um, you so much, Tom. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of the STL Bucket List Show. Um, like we mentioned in the episode, we really just focus on supporting people, places, and events. Um, and we want to be that source for independent media right here in St. Louis. Um, so shout out Four Hands, our drink sponsors, um, Hapco Studios, and, of course, the Regional Arts Commission of St. Louis, um, who um, is just an awesome partner. Mm -hmm. So see you guys next week. Today they rep St. Louis, yeah. They rep St. Louis. They rep St. Louis.